Kathy Burnett is Professor of Literacy and Education at Sheffield Institute of Education, Sheffield Hallam University, where she leads the Language and Literacy Education Research Group. And her research has focused predominantly on the relationship between new technologies and literacies within and beyond educational contexts from a socio-material perspective. And Guy Merchant is Professor of Literacy and Education at Sheffield Institute of Education, Sheffield Hallam University in the UK. And his research explores the ways in which literacy and technology intersect in the lives of children and young people. And there's uh, further information about um, the bios of both of our speakers in the notes from today as well. Uh, but with no further ado, I'm going to hand over to Cathy and Guy. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, Michael. Um, thank you for those introductions. Uh, I'm going to take the lead. Um, but thank you first very much for uh, inviting us to this great seminar series. Um, it's really good. And uh, also to see such wonderful uh, participation. I was going to say so early in the morning, but of course, it isn't early in the morning where you are. Thank you, Michael, uh, Annette and Ni nee for all the uh, background work as well. Um, what we're going to do is roughly split this presentation down the middle. I'm going to lead on the first half and then Cathy will take over. Um, it's uh, a bright sunny morning uh, here in uh, Sheffield, so I've had to close the shutters, but I think you should see me okay. I don't know what it's like uh, where Cathy is, but she'll probably tell you. Um, we're sort of together and apart, uh, neither here nor there. Um, so, with no further ado, let's begin uh, with our first slide, which I hope Cathy will uh, advance for us. <laughs> so, here you're looking at the Chasers, uh, named after the popular ITV uh, quiz show, a gang of soft toys, and you can recognise some of them. Uh, Centre screen, we have Elma, uh, and then we have uh, Iron Man from uh, the uh, Marvel Comics franchise. And uh, with his back to us, we have uh, Eminem, the uh, animated chocolate character. What are they doing? Well, they're busy reenacting re a scene from Friends, season seven, episode 14, the one where they all turn 30. Uh, Joey is played by Eminem here, and he's railing against the aging process, screeching out, why God, why? Well, it's a still from a video made by a six-year-old boy uploaded to his YouTube channel. And uh, the complex work, which this is, only attracts a handful of views and his subscribers are all family members. But what's going on uh, is uh, far, more close, far more complex when you look closer to it. Uh, it draws on narrative material from screen and print, from popular culture, from everyday family life, classic recontextualization, if you like. But it also involves delicate adjustments of an iPad balanced on top of an upturned wash basket purse, all to get the best angle. And the characters are carefully moved around, captured in stop motion style, so as to conceal the child's efforts uh, to reposition them. The final project uploaded to YouTube, playfully enacted, but is clearly a complex or orchestration of texts, technologies, bodies and things, many of which are actually hidden from view. So our question today, and I think we're probably going to be raising more questions than giving answers, are uh, how we apply critical literacies in what you might say uh, uh, is an age of new media. So clearly, um, for children growing up, like uh, the one whose video I've just um, talked about, there are plenty of opportunities for these things like creativity, expression, collaboration, and so forth, um, all drawing on uh, the rich meaning resources uh, around them. But also, of course, we've got new concerns. Some of them are set out there. And also some of the challenges of actually making sense of the kinds of digital play that we talked about. Here we've got issues of surveillance, commercialization, and so forth. And we've also got uh, the sense that the text that we see, and you've only seen a still of it, um, 
is perhaps only part of a much longer chain of meaning making. So that's the sort of terrain we're in. Um, now, of course, this is kind of rehearsing what uh, will be well known to you, um, but um, let's just pause for a moment, have a little bit of a recap uh, on those um, key figures of critical pedagogy and critical literacy. Um, so we know uh, and have learned how power plays through um, the lives of children um, uh, and uh, children's interactions and school contexts and, or, uh, and so on. Um, we know very well how we're all positioned by dominant discourses and practices. Um, and there is the argument, a uh, well-worn argument, which I think we've all signed up to at some stage in our careers, that we need to reclaim power by creating new spaces uh, for dialogue. Um, and all this could, of course, be applied even to the rather banal um, reenactment that uh, we started off with. Um, but to move on um, quite quickly to um, critical literacy, um, in, in critical literacy, we've seen um, language as a, as a, central, um, a central player in, um, in deconstructing, if you like, um, the workings of power. Um, and uh, that has involved finding spaces where meanings can be, well, they can be analysed, but they can also be rewritten, produced and constructed. Uh, certainly not merely reproduced or asserted once again. And there's been a great tradition of work in this. Um, whether it has succeeded uh, in inoculating children and young people against the ravages of populism and a cook, um, a consumer society is probably um, a moot question. Uh, but um, that's perhaps something for further discussion. Um, so moving on now, um, we have obviously the question of how might or, or how could we apply these practices of um, critical literacy to the digital world or to worlds in which the digital plays a strong part, which I think is more the way I'd like to see it. Um, so we're talking about densely woven spaces, uh, the chasers reenacting friends on YouTube just really is a touchstone for thinking about that. Um, very often, of course, in digital spaces, authorship is unclear or distributed, a uh, bit clearer in my example, but uh, we, we're, we're aware of that clearly. And there's this obvious fluidity, ephemerality and informality of texts. And of course, there have been some uh, criticisms um, or um, warnings about critical practice, um, you know, uh, to the extent that Bruno Latour says, uh, has critique run out of steam? Um, are we just uh, encouraging a slightly uh, sceptical take on things? Uh, are we, as David Buckingham says, killing the pleasure in popular texts by trying to analyse them? And uh, do we end up just uh, creating ironic spectators rather than open-minded and creative thinkers? Um, these are some of the questions. So um, our central thought is uh, that critical literacy needs to engage with more than just the text. So hopefully the Chaser's example at the uh, top of this presentation might make us think how texts get made, how they get remade, how they move and how they morph in a web of relations. So if we're going to take uh, a different perspective, we believe that it needs to address texts and see them as situated in a web 
uh, of relations, or as we put on this slide, in a network of relationships. Here's a second example um, drawn from the uh, more pokey uh, political debate domain, I think. So um, Stella Creasy is Member of Parliament for Walthamstow in um, East London, and um, this story broke all within, um, I think probably within 12 hours. Um, the company called, ironically, the company is called Anomaly, and they service digital notice boards in schools. And uh, they had the clever idea that they would follow some curriculum guidance and put up some stuff about nationality always a touchy subject, uh, in which um, pictures of Boris Johnson and the slogans about uniting the UK and getting Brexit done. By the way, this was just before um, the Brexit vote, um, appeared on something like 3,000 digital notice boards in primary schools. Um, whether there was any um, malevolent uh, political force behind that or not. It's very difficult to unscramble. But the fact of the matter is, parents were, um, uh, we would say, gobsmacked. And uh, um, Stella Creasy picked up on this straight away from her constituents and tweeted it. Um, and then asked a question of the Prime Minister um, in the House of Commons. Um, and here's her second tweet, or it might have been her third, where she actually tweets the video of herself asking questions in Parliament. Uh, and so rapidly um, transferring across domains are all these sorts of texts, the original text on the school notice board, um, the tweet, the communication with parents and head teachers, the question in the Houses of Parliament, and of course this hit the national press later on in the same day. Perhaps uh, a very telling example of um, what um, Chris Keller calls the traffic of texts. And I think I'm moving to Cathy now who will need to unmute. I thought I was staying on a bit longer, but it's, it's fine, yes. Yeah. So uh, I won't expect you on that, on that example, except to just summarise some of the things that perhaps pull out of there, that if we're thinking about literacy, we of course think of it as multimodal, but I, multimodal, but I think Guy's drawn out there the fluidity and the instability of the text, that as the tweet um, mobilises the initial display screen from the school and then passes it into the House of Parliament and then back to parents and so forth, it sort of becomes something else. And this notion of um, text and readership and authorship sort of get um, reworked. And now my screen has frozen. Excellent. There we go. Um, so um, one of the things that we, we've been thinking about this, this notion for a while and thinking about, well, how do we think of critical literacy in relation to these things? Um, and we wrote a paper about 10 years ago now trying to think, well, if we think of critical literacy in relation to networks or webs of relations between texts, what would that actually mean? What would we actually be looking at? We wouldn't just be looking at text. We'd be looking at the practices in which texts um, are used, we'd think about the identities that are produced as people engage with text, um, and we'd think of the different connect connections that are made. And we began to sort of explore how that might generate an approach to critical literacy that looked more expansively about what people do with text and what people come through text and use that to focus for the critical reflection. Um, but if we think about the, the Stella Creasy example, this doesn't quite do all of that, there's something else going on there. Um, and probably in the last decade or so, we've been thinking a lot about the role of materiality within these webs of relations. Um, and of course, in the Stella Christie example, we might think about what the text became in the Houses of Parliament, as opposed to what it became 
in the school entrance hall when it was displayed, when the um, original slides were displayed on the screen. And there's something about the um, felt environment, the material spaces that we're in that begin to play into what texts become. Um, but it's even more complicated than that, of course, because not only do we need to think about those, those physical spaces, but we also need to think about um, the role of digital actors in propelling those texts from place to place. And we'll say a bit more about that in a moment. But um, all of this <laughs> complex sort of exploration of different webs of relations leads us to sort of um, this, which is in very, very brief summary, is the social material perspective that we've been working with for the last few years. Um, as bodies come into relation with other bodies, they affect and are affected by them. They become different and subsequently generate other ways of being and doing. By bodies, we don't just mean human bodies, we mean bodies and all kinds of things, such as bodies and texts and algorithms and school policy and um, parliamentary systems. So we're talking about how what happens as all of those things intersect, interrelate with one another, they affect and are affected by them. And the central idea here is that things become in relation. And if things become in relation, then there is always the potential for them to be something else. And there is always the potential for things to combine in unexpected ways. And I think those ideas emerge from this thinking about um, relationality. And they have interesting things to trace really when we then start to think about critical literacy. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and trace through some of those ideas and um, end with some, some questions or thoughts. Um, so to summarize where we've got through so far, we could think about how authorship becomes something different as it sits with webs, webs of relations between people and texts and algorithms and buildings and so on. How readership becomes something very particular when it sits in particular social material relations and becomes something very else when it sits in other, when those relations kind of shift and move. And similarly, how text doesn't, it's not just a discrete, texts aren't discrete things, they become in certain ways as they are situated in particular kinds of sets of relations and they become something else as those relations move. Um, but also, and this, this is evident, I think, in um, everyday life, when we see the workings of machine learning and artificial intelligence, we have this all the time, don't we? I, I go on to search for something and I'm told a whole list of all kinds of things that I might be interested in. Um, I'm going to buy something online and I'm immediately given a whole suggestion of list of things that I might because of course, all of my work online is operating, as Hansen says, not just as a service level, it's not just doing the things that I'm intending to do, but at a data level, I'm generating and producing data that's then um, working in particular ways in relation with other sets of relations. Um, and in a sense, what we're engaged in is what um, Pacara, Artio and Velasmo call digital labor. We're um, working for huge Milton multinational companies to produce data through our search histories and so on um, that can be utilised and taken up in different ways. And, and I think we're aware of this and we're very aware that this um, phenomenon, if you like, needs to be um, accommodated in our concept of critical literacy, because all of this is essentially textual activity. It's all about the traffic of text, as Cal said. Um, but what's interesting, I think, is that what happens isn't always as expected, and it's not always exclusively as a result of human interaction. And what happens through um, interactions between people and sex and others and so on are all sorts of unexpected or unanticipated results. Um, an example of this, uh, a famous example, I think, um, Amazon commissioned an algorithm to be used to sort people's seats with the kinds of jobs. And the algorithm learnt what a good employee looked like, and it learnt it from the CVs of existing employees who were all male. And so subsequently, the algorithm sorted all the um, best CVs as male CVs. And I, I, whatever we think about Amazon, I, I think it's unlikely that they commissioned an algorithm to sort male applicants. But that's what happened because 
the algorithm works in relation with a whole load of existing practices, assumptions that were built into prior practices within the company, and it plays out in a particular way. And, and we see this as well, where algorithms come in relation with one another and generate unexpected results. So to add to all this complexity of um, rethinking authorship, authorship, readership, technology, and so forth, we also need to sort of deal with this very contingent, very fluid, very unstable environment, um, which I think is, is challenging perhaps when we try to think about critical literacy. Masumi, in a sort of critique of critique, argues that in order to try and critique something in any definite kind of way, you have to pin it down. And I guess that's that's the difficult. How do you pin down what's going on here? What do you look at as your focus for critique? How do you deal with this kind of shifting fluid environment? Um, and I guess those are the, the challenges that we're beginning to try and think through. So um, if we think about people, text, and power from a socio-material perspective. We need to see those things as produced in relation. And we need to begin to understand how social material relations hold equities in place, but they do that through continuing to assemble and come into relation to one another. Um, we need to see, not just looking at text, but we need to think about the ideological positioning of, of the devices we use and the digital architectures that we navigate as well. We need to bear in mind that things unfold in the moment and they play out in unexpected ways. And we need to focus on networks, socio-material networks, if we're going to begin to um, get anywhere near the notion of critique. Uh, that's, uh, I've waffled on for a while, so here's a sort of practical example to begin to think through some of these things. Here's a, um, a Creative Commons photo of a, of a Zoom call, which I suspect is very similar to the one we're on now um, and the ones that people are in. It's interesting to think, I think what socio-material perspective invites us to do in thinking about relationality is to begin to think, well, how do we interrogate what's going on? And if we, if we think about this, what's going on here? Well, you've got a people, group of people meeting, great. Or you've got a visual display of a number of images, great. What else is going on? We could think about the relationship between all of those aspects of those people's rooms that go beyond the screen, that expand beyond the frame. Um, we could think of those neatly framed smiles that somehow are being generated as a way of operating within online meetings. And what does that mean for the way people are able to be or behave towards one another? We might think of um, Zoom as a large multinational corporation and the amount of money generated through this enforced online working. We might think of what happens through our, um, our emerging protocol, emerge protocols around um, muting and so forth and um, shielding our screen and so forth. What does that do for the way we interact with one another? What does it do when we change the format so that instead of um, present it, having it in presenter view where the person speaking, me at the moment, is there front and central. Instead of that, we have it in this more display mode where we see everybody. In this particular Zoom call, I think the person on the top left is speaking, but somehow their authority is shifts a bit, doesn't it, when they're placed on screen next to everybody else's face. We might notice that there are no natural um, there are no, well, there are, there's a couple of houseplants, I think, in one of the images, but primarily these are indoor shots. What does it mean to conceive the, the um, and one of guys, what does it mean to um, conceive that our spaces that we're in as primarily indoor manufactured spaces? Um, so we could kind of interrogate and think about this particular image and what's going on here as happening as produced through multiple different sets of relations. And I guess um, that's really some what we're moving towards is that if we're trying to sort of meet the ambitions of critical literacy, if you like, ultimately to think about how do we generate a more socially just, environmentally sustainable world, maybe we need to think about what we, we've called and other people have called as well, an ethic of caring. Maybe we need to think about how do we continually unsettle our established ways of viewing and framing and ordering the world? And through that, and this is a tricky one, how do we sense possibilities to be otherwise? 
And that could be at very local level in our interactions with one another, um, as well as more broadly with a more kind of activist agenda. And how do we, what, what is it that we do as we come into relation with one another in the world that works in ways that does things in ways that are more equitable, social, politically, environmentally just? Those are grand ambitions. So to bring it down to earth a little bit, we're going to just end with some very um, tentative implications and some tentative questions which we think are relevant for teachers, for other educators, but also for researchers, because of, res of course, research also intervenes in the world that it seeks to investigate on the social Um So, of course, we need to think that um, critical literacy isn't just responding to the world, but it's constructing it with them. I think this is an old idea that we've had well established within critical literacy practice for some time, but it's well worth remembering that that's there. Um, Hilary Lenskucci, a long time ago, talked about this notion of, of teaching, actually, and she was talking very much about teaching, of viewing ourselves in a constant and mutual state of responsibility for what happens in the multiple interactions emerging in the learning event, as we affect and are being affected by everything else. And that's quite an interesting quote. To me, it sort of just describes teaching. <laughs> it's what we do, isn't it? We, we operate in, with this kind of intense sensitivity to what's going on and think about how we might work to um, shape, explore, work with what's going on in order to move things on in productive ways. I think that's what she's saying there. But there's a thing about sensing possibility there of trying to be sensitive to what potential might be emerging in any moment, any in any classroom or any situation. And then um, Bennett's idea of enchantment perhaps is helpful here. Very easy, I think, in education, and in our context in England, extremely easy to approach education with a, um, um, a, as a, a with disenchantment, if you like. But Bennett's idea of enchantment here, we think is valuable here, of a fascination, of being intrigued, of being um, sensitive to what's going on and constantly interrogating what it is that's going on here and how then do we work generously and ethically within that. Um, so some questions. When we're working as educators and as researchers, which relations do we hold in the frame and which not? And if we focus on some things, what aren't we focusing on? Huge, um, quite rightly, huge concern in the UK as elsewhere about um, inequities during lockdown learning of children not being able to access digital technology. It really brought to the fore um, the need for digital devices and the lack of digital devices in many homes. Clearly, that's something we should be looking at and thinking about. But there are other things in there that get written out of that argument about the um, conditions in which those devices were produced in the first place, the working conditions of people that built them, the environmental implications of the, um, the uh, elements that were used in the manufacture. So there's something about how we all, how we frame social injustice and how we always, how we need to continually re-interrogate that frame to decide what it is that we want to be thinking about. And thinking. thinking about what possibilities come into play, but also in, in the light of that, what we might want to nurture and disrupt. And all of this, I think, this sort of grand exploration of socio-materiality brings us to some um, familiar ideas. I mean, Barbara Comer's idea about a pedagogy of possibility, school as a meeting place, is really helpful here in thinking about these concepts. And even thinking more broadly about open-ended arts-based, play-based pedagogies, the kind of approaches that allow us to be sensitive, that allow us to engage differently with relations and shift the kinds of habitual relations that we find ourselves in are, I think, helpful. Guy and I wrote a book um, a few years ago called New Media in the Classroom, and we list about nine things that we think would be helpful coming from this perspective. And they're all very, very familiar things, things about using play-based approaches and improvisation, embracing feeling and um, those kinds of things. So I don't think the implications are um, rocket science but they are perhaps derived from a different way of thinking and interrogating and perhaps, dare I say, feeling with what's going on in education and thinking about how we might respond to that. 
And um, so I will end with this um, quote from Brian Massumi, which perhaps um, sums up better than I've done what we're trying to argue. But if the focus then is on potentiality, on the propensity for something to be taken up, then how can the event, how can what's happening, how can what's going on be nurtured in such a way that this is more likely to happen? And I will finish there, thank you. Thank you. Look, I always find these settings um, so void of any kind of appreciation because there are no claps there, but thank you very much. Um, somebody put into the chat that um, she was nodding her head off even behind the um, behind the, cam the um, camera that was turned off. So thank you. Look, I have the great joy of being able to um, ask you to step across to the fire so that we can have a bit of a fireside chat. Um, and and that's kind of funny considering I'm sitting here in about 28 degrees um, uh, here at you know, almost six o'clock in Brisbane. But anyway, so some questions that, that come out of um, what you've just been talking about. You talked about um, bodies and as they become in relations, um, they become different and they generate other ways of doing and being. Um, and we're particularly interested in the methodological opportunities of bringing socio-material perspectives to research. So I'm just wondering if you could pin down as those um, different ways of being, generating other ways of being and doing, um, what are the methodological considerations of, an, of understanding um, the world in that way? Uh, shall I hand over to you because I've been talking for a while and you can take this one. Yeah. I think it's your turn. Also, I wasn't listening to the question, but uh, <laughs> oh, I, there you go. <laughs> I, I, I don't. It's, it's about it's about methodologies. Um, yeah. Um, well, the methodological sort of opportunities and challenges, uh, I, I think, are absolutely really exciting. Um, so, in the work that we've done, um, trying to ask that question about how, as a researcher, you're actually active and producing. Uh, what's going on uh, is a radical departure from um, ways I'd seen research before. But also when we're asking the question, what else is present? What else is in relation here? Uh, we have to cast our net wider. We get into the realm of feelings, uh, of what's hidden from direct view, uh, what's working in the background. And I think that requires uh, a particular kind of sensitivity and also perhaps um, a kind of creativity uh, that, uh, that that is, is quite exciting. Cathy? Yeah, um, I mean one of the things that we've we've played around for a while now is the idea of um, writing multiple stories of different events that try and tap into different things that are going on, um, partly in order to provide different um, perspectives but also through, as you put different stories of a different episode or whatever together, what they do is they provide different um, perspectives, but they also perhaps invite us to go, what else is going on here? What are the things that are missed? Um, and they also perhaps um, through storying, as opposed to our sort of more traditional accepted academic mode of writing, um, through storying, they perhaps evoke feeling and response in a slightly different way. So uh, and that's just one example that we've played around with. I think being experimental creative with the way that we sort of document or narrate or story or rework what we encounter through field work is, we think is really useful but also thinking about what those things do when they enter into different relations i think this is it's trying to think the the um, publication of the paper or the presentation of the research center isn't the end point it becomes something else as it moves into, as perhaps if anybody watches the recording of this seminar, for example, it will become something very different again from what it is at, at this moment in time. Um, so, there's, so there's something for us about being creative about the methods that we're using, also thinking about what happens as those methods get inserted into the world. That helps. Yeah, it does. Thank you. <laughs> Um, you put forward that old adage from critical literacy and um, those of us that have been hanging around critical literacy for a while, as you said, it won't be new to be thinking about we want to do other than just work with children. We actually want it 
you know, in worlds. We actually want to be constructing the world with them. There's a constant tension, I think, isn't there, between taking a socio-material approach and a desire as educational researchers perhaps to, to kind of centre the human in research or the child in research, particularly, you know, when we're wanting to consider um, children as being agentive and the implications around social justice of having access to certain forms of, of literacy education um, or not. So I'm wondering if you can um, just unpack that a little bit and think about um, notions around relations, you know, with what and with whom, and how do we actually contribute to achieving a more just world um, in um, always keeping those networks to the foreground um, and, and always attempting to not centre the child within that. Yeah, I think it's re really difficult, isn't it? Because it, it's, as an ex-primary teacher, the, the the central thing as a teacher is how do you nurture the child <laughs> and how do you empower and enable and, and all of those things that we want and and I think somewhere along the line we use the word agency and that's an important word because it makes the transition to it gives it political weight which is really important but we've been kind of thinking around that notion of agency and what does it mean to approach that from a socio-material perspective and perhaps it, it it gives you a different um, slant, if you like, that perhaps opens up other ways of thinking. Uh, so if we think of agency as relational, if we think of agency as an, is not as um, belonging to the individual, but as produced in relation, then that, um, does it make you do different things? It certainly makes you understand what's going on in classrooms differently, I think. Um, and it certainly sensitizes you to thinking about how do we continually um, reconfigure or how do we try to work to reconfigure the way that relations are assembling together in and around practice. So I think it opens out um, other possibilities for thinking about critical literacy. Uh -huh. Guy, do you want to? So we might think about um, gathering and being together um, they're kind of nice, loose concepts, aren't they? Uh, and then when we kind of apply those to this complex web of relations that we've been talking about, I think things begin to look a little bit different. It's not about the individual subject suddenly having the realisation that they are um, completely uh, held in place by um, power structures. Uh, although that is a useful perspective, um, this is an alternative perspective, I want to sort of underline that, but then things look rather differently. Um, how, how can you work together with all the relationships that are coming together, for example, in a classroom context, uh -huh. um, to make or produce something um, that, uh, uh, you, you know, does all those, ticks all those ethical boxes. Sorry, that sounds a little bit cynical, but it's just a quick way of not saying <laughs> environmentally sustainable, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, equitable, yeah. yeah. And then if we push that a little bit further around moving into thinking about an ethic of care, how does that sit um, with thinking around notions of not only giving care, but also the receiving of care? And the caregiver and the care receiver, I guess, you know, out of ideas from Lynch and, and even Noddings. Mm. Yes, I'm, I'm just. Sorry, <laughs> 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 close down the discussion. Yeah, so um, I'll I'll start talking, then Guy can chip in. Um, and I don't know if this is this is responding to what you're asking at all, really. But I think. I think the notion of care is a really interesting one. And I think it's um, been undermined and undervalued um, probably for all kinds of reasons associated with gender. I think care is a hugely political activity and the hugely challenging and um, difficult activity in whichever context we find ourselves in, whether that's in our interpersonal relationships with one another or whether that's in our broader operation within our institutional um, and broader roles or whether it's in our wider <laughs> political lives or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a really important um, concept to hold on to as an educator and as a researcher because it's because her essentially sits in relations. It doesn't exist outside of relations. 
and so if we prioritise care, what it does is it gives us an active role in participating in um, the environments that we're in. It also, as you say, is um, reciprocal. So there's, there's always a sense of being cared for as well as caring. Um, and as a, as a primary educator that, you know, we, we would, many of us, I'm sure, who have experience of primary education would, would see care is absolutely central to what we're doing. It's been eradicated as far as I can see from the frameworks in which we operate in education. And I don't think that, I, 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 cynically, I don't think that's necessarily just because it's a soft concept. I think there is a politi politi politicization of care um, or depoliticization of care that is significant. So I, I think it's a hugely important concept that we need to hold on to. Um, Guy, you, you'll probably say something more articulate than that. Uh, it won't be my <laughs> Cassie, but it might be a bit different. Um, I, I'm thinking about how we live well. Um, that's a question. How do how do we live well um, with the things uh, around us and the fellow creatures and so forth? How do we live well uh, has been, I think, a bit eradicated by um, market policies, uh, which are about how do we produce stuff or, or how do we sell stuff? Um, so there's kind of almost, almost a philosophical question lurking behind that. Um, how do we live well with each other? How do we live well on the planet? Um, and, and for me, that's central. And um, it, 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 it lurks behind the ethic of caring uh, for me. Um, and you can see that playing out in classrooms, how we live well just fades into the background. Uh, it's more about what have we achieved, what have we produced, how we judged. Uh, there are very few conversations uh, about how do we live well, but of course those that do happen, happen uh, <laughs> um, off the radar as teachers do actually care for their children and children do care for each other and people do care about their environment. But the, um, the, the dominant narrative uh, does, doesn't have this uh, written into it. So uh, that would be my view. And how do we live well in relation, I guess, is a nice place to, to start. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'll hand across to Michael because I've had the opportunity to ask some questions and I know that others are also doing so. So thank you very much for engaging at that level as well. Thanks, Annette, and, and thanks, Kathy and Guy, for such a, um, a provocative um, presentation. Um, it's, it's certainly given me a lot to think about. Um, so we do have some questions here, and um, some of these folks would like me to read these questions out and others will. Um, turn on their cameras. So the first is from Linda Tan. Um, and she asks you, Kathy, if you could talk a little bit more about the concept of interactions um, within these theories of socio-materiality, I think, just to uh, explain that concept a little bit more. Yeah, and um, th thanks for asking that. It's actually a concept that we deliberately don't use in our own writing. <laughs> it's in one of it's in one of the quotes from in, in our presentation. So it appeared there is um, a quote from Hilary Lanza Taguchi, but um, it's not something we use. I'll, maybe I'll try and say how I how I think I we understand it, and also perhaps why we don't use it. Um, the way that I understand interactions from Barard is that what you're talking about is something more than interactions. You're talking about the mutual constitution of things. Um, and I think that's a really useful concept um, and she uses it in many useful ways and so do many people. I think it's um, often not used like that. <laughs> I think it's used as inter interactions actually. Um, and so quite often. And so I think we've, we've found that sort of muddiness around people's perhaps different interpretations of the term perhaps isn't hasn't been useful for us I'm sure it has been and will be for lots of other people we tend to talk about things um, coming into relation and we tend to go back to that notion of things affecting and being affected by which is essentially what interaction is about but it, it feels clearer to 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 ref to keep referring back to that effect and be affected by it feels clearer to us. So that, that's where we're coming from. 
Great, thank you. Um, the next question is from D uh, Davina so Sorate, and um, I'll ask um, her to um, ask that question themselves. Sure, thank you. Um, so I put my question down in chat, but I'll give a little background. Um, I study uh, young people in social media in India, uh, the age group is 10 to 18 years. And when I speak with them, they tell me that they are aware that uh, whatever they do online is, is a trade-off uh, between what they're, they're using on the platform and privacy and safety issues. So as we're moving from the network self to the algorithm itself, where platforms have a lot of power about what we see on, on, uh, on our For You pages or on our feeds, um, is there something that we can do um, to get institutions of governance and business that are responsible in creating this environment uh, to do their bit as, as critical literacy scholars? And I mean, essentially to go back to your presentation, how do we get them to care? Also, amazing presentation. Thank you so much. Good question, Guy, your turn. Yeah, okay, thank you, uh, Davina. L lovely question. Um, yeah, um, it's very difficult, isn't it, to get these um, uh, larger institutions and corporations uh, to care because that is the sinister world that's almost now uh, got more power than state power um, and uh, quite often they're not really answerable to anybody um, so I think um, although we should try and rail against uh, what they do uh, it actually does come down to the micro level about what we do uh, and what we do uh, with students in, in classrooms. Um, it, it, it's, uh, um, and, and I think when I was talking about gathering and um, you know, coming together, uh, being together. I, I think they're the, the locus of care um, because there are always powerful forces outside. And, um, you know, um, it's beyond a lot of us uh, to take them on. So I think it's much better if we have a kind of, um, what would you say, a sort of nimble orientation to them. But um, my, I take my hat off uh, to campaign and people who, who are doing that work of addressing large corporations. But uh, it's a tricky one, and it's a tricky one for educators to engage in. Cathy? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I've got a, a huge amount of work. What I want, what I want to say is how, how can we subvert, use, resist those practices? Um, and I think that might be a question for us to think about as, as we engage with them, what, what, what do we do? And subsequently, are there ways in which those begin to be reconfigured? But um, that's uh, I, I can't answer that. It's it's a it's a hope and an aspiration. Perhaps you might have ideas. Uh, thank you. So I have a question here from Kenneth Pedersen, um, and um, he's asking: setting out from a relational perspective, um, where does this the more bounded unit of analysis? So I guess it's a question about how far do you take those relationships and those interactions where does it stop yeah so we, <laughs> I guess this, this is one we sort of struggle with we wrote um, a paper just recently which kind of starts off with a, a tiny interaction between a couple of children in an early years setting and then says oh but what else is going on here you know there's the local education policy there's the broader socio-economic context there's the environmental um, implications of the stuff that's happening in this classroom. There's the microorganisms that are living on the child's scalp that are part of this. And I, I guess that's, um, that's the territory that you enter into as soon as you start to engage with relationality because you have to. Um, and of course you always make selections. There's always a cut, isn't there, in terms of what you decide you want to play into that, what's going in and what isn't. But I guess there's there's a reflexivity around the implications of making that particular cut, um, and also uh, a need to acknowledge there are other ways of thinking, knowing, understanding what's going on, and also to work to begin to try and approach from those other ways. But um, 
yeah, that the notion of using the unit of land analysis actually becomes problematic and the subject of a huge amount of reflexivity, I guess. Um, Guy, do you want to add to that? Well, just the, 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 I was thinking of exactly the same paper, but um, wh when it came to the sort of um, fossil fuels underneath the ground of the school, that was kind of quite interesting thought process because, of course, that <laughs> actually uh, has a very intimate connection to the social and economic um, context uh, uh, in which in, in which that work was set so it's bizarre so I, I think there is a um, you obviously need to make the cut um, Marilyn Stratham wrote a lovely paper called Cutting the Network which was uh, which addressed that um, but in a way before you cut the network <laughs> <laughs> so to speak, but before you draw a boundary around it, it's really useful to expand outwards. And I think that's one of the um, one of the opportunities of, uh, of this way of working, actually, um, because it didn't occur to me um, personally when I was thinking through this particular uh, bit of field work, how um, what had happened, um, was it millions of years? I don't know, whenever those um, big trees started making coal, that that was actually connected to what these four and five year olds were doing on iPads in a very interesting sort of way. Um, so th there's an opportunity, but I agree, we have to bound it. Um, otherwise people just laugh at our general articles for a start you know. <laughs> but uh, important isn't it and, and it's important as we gain more awareness of earth as a planet w which is very pressing at the moment sorry I, I was going on a bit I'll, I'll stop it's all right um so I think we've got time for just one or two more questions um so Eve Mays is asking um she says that Max uh Le Boyron writes in pollution is colonialism um, and that's about care as always already a governing practice how might we think and act care whilst always attuned to how we as educators are never pure there's never pure horizon uh, never a pure horizontality of power relations yeah i i, I think you're absolutely right and um of course <laughs> um care in acts power relations in all kinds of ways. I guess there's a um, there's a place for reclaiming and reconfiguring and perhaps reinterrogating what care might be and look like, I guess, might be my response to that. And I think it comes back to the previous question that where do we where do we see the boundaries between what we do? So um, we could read caring relationships between teachers and, and children in classrooms in very particular ways um, and in very kind of habitual ways, what might it be to think about how, how different might that look or what might that look if we looked beyond the classroom to the location of the learning or the interactions within a local setting, for example, what might care be then? What might um, care be for the natural environment around the school and for other species around the school. Um, it's not really getting at what you're asking, but I guess I think the problem perhaps isn't with care as a notion itself, but within care as it manifests within particular habitual ways of people coming into relation. I think. Guy. Yes, I mean, uh, there's, there's, there's clearly thinking work to be done here. Um, I was immediately thinking, I, I was thinking of, um, well, carers in different settings and, 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 and they're very often um, deeply implicated in power relations, actually. So it's not as if care is immune from power. Um, but I think we're, we're arguing sort of care as a relational thing but that might need some fleshing out mm -hmm. so um but i basically thank you for the question <laughs> it's, uh, it, yeah. it's that's thought provoking yeah okay well i think we do have to stop there because we're just um about um at the hour and um we do have some more questions coming in but we're um yeah, we we do like to finish on time um and respect people's uh time so thank you um so much for that terrific presentation, Kathy and Guy. It was really fantastic. And um, 
I'd um, invite people to now perhaps um, show, them, show themselves on camera if you would like to do that and unmute and, and let's uh, uh, give our presenters a clap. Well, that's much better, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It is a bit disconcerting not seeing faces, um, but it is better for the actual, um, yeah, for the internet connection. So thank you so much. Um, if you're in Melbourne, we hope you haven't been impacted by the um, by the earth earthquake earlier today. Um, just another thing to throw at you. Um, we will be back in two weeks time on the Thursday evening um, for our next uh, presentation. And if you want details about that, you can check that out on the digital child website. Um, thank you all for coming along and thank you again, Kathy and Guy. Thank you, Kathy and Guy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the lovely questions as well.